And I want to welcome you to our Noontime with the Bulldogs, sponsored by Mako Medical. I want to welcome our guest today. We have our very own UNC Asheville alum, Mike Schilt, who is also in our Hall of Fame and who is presently the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals. And I know this is game day, Mike, so we're going to really, we're going to keep things hot here. Because you're okay. Man. And then my other guest today is our very own Scott Friedholm, straight off the baseball diamond. Scott, that's a picture there of you with a little more hair, I think, or something there. So we'll save that for later. And of course, behind the scenes, David Jandrews co-hosting this with me. And we'll be taking questions from um, those of you that are tuning in. I have to thank Mako Medical once again, who who's the official tester of UNC Asheville Athletics and has kept us going all year. And, and as we're continually um, competing, as baseball has still got a few more weeks and as our track folks are um, at high point for the Big South track, track Championships as we speak. So, Mike, I'm going to start with you. And I've already promised you I was not going to like catch you too off guard, but... <laughs> You know, our friends, our Bulldog friends are always fascinated about the stories, the stories behind you know, how you got to be a St. Louis manager. But take us back. I know you're from North Carolina. Tell us your story um, for those of for those of us that just love the stories behind co college athletics and professional sports. Yeah, I, um, I'll try to give the Reader's Digest version because, um, you know, I'm getting older, Janet. So there's there's more stories. Um <laughs> So I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. I grew up in a double-A clubhouse with the Charlotte O's, who was the minor league affiliate of the Baltimore Orioles. My mom was the administrative secretary assistant to Francis Crockett, who um, was a general manager. And, you know, I, I cut my teeth then growing up in a professional baseball setting and did a little bit of everything, shine shoes, um, watch the uniforms, um, you know, ran the scoreboard for seven years, worked on full tarp, sold nachos, chase style balls, you know, anything and everything to let me do, I, I would do it. Um, and just a, just a magical childhood that gave me the experiences that quite candidly, I didn't realize I was even receiving and, until I got a little bit older. Of course, my passion was to play Major League Baseball and went to Olympic High School and had a uh, pretty ordinary um, Legion and uh, high school career, but good enough that a couple of my teammates helped me get recruited to UNC Asheville, Mark Rosenbaum, who's also in the um, – you know, UNCA Hall of Fame and, and a guy named John Turner, who maybe one day um, really good players. And I rode their coattails to UNC Asheville and um, just had a just had a wonderful experience as a as a, as a very below average player and um, somewhat uh, somehow got through it academically, you know, and got a, a degree in business um, and then coached and started my coaching career at UNC Asheville, which I'm always grateful for. And um you know, since then, I just wanted to coach and teach and, and help grow young men and 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 um, just really care more about their careers than my own and was blessed to get into the Cardinal organization in 2004 as a scout with the promise of being able to coach some some uh, rookie ball at the lower levels, um, you know, during the season outside of my scouting season. And I looked up about three or four years into the end of that process, and I think they realized this guy can't you know, not a very good scout. Um, so maybe you can throw some batting practice and, and help hit some fungos and coach some of our guys. And, you know, the organization was very, has been very, very good to me um, and allowed me more opportunities and experiences and had a lot of people within the organization pour into me and guide me and mentor me. And, um, you know, no, no real um, vision for what I'm currently doing. Um, and next thing, you know, I look up and, I'm getting a managing double A and triple A and then fortunate to get on the big league staff. And um, here we are, the manager and pitch myself every day. Wow. Well, that, that's a great um, segue here because I've got so many questions for you. I want to kind of go back to um, UNC Asheville when you came in. You mentioned Mark and John Turner and some others. Tell us some stories about your your playing days at UNC Asheville and your teammates, because one of the things that um, obviously we have quite a few alums, but our baseball alums keep showing up for when we play golf and baseball night. But there's something special about baseball alums. So share a couple of stories maybe about your time as a student athlete here and some of your teammates. 
Yeah, you know, that's the, that was a huge blessing of being able to um, – I mean, it's a very close group. You know, our group, um, we showed up and there was no field. You know, the, the field you see now, which uh, thankfully and hopefully people are listening to continue to contribute and uh, do what they can to make those facilities as good as they can because that's a huge part of the recruiting and the competitive spirit that takes place in college athletics, as we all know. But, um, you know, showed up with a group of guys just that we're still close with and um, – you know, literally help build that field, build the dugouts and, um, you know, put, pick rocks off the field and, and just do a little bit of everything in between playing some baseball. And, you know, just it, it drew our group really close and um, we're still close today. We just lost a, one of our really close teammates, Mark Fox, who I know and I'm appreciative of Scott Coach Friedholm to uh, memorialize Jeff with a patch on the jersey, um, passed away from COVID recently. And, uh but it's, it's, you know, a lot of special memories, a lot of bonding, um, a lot of, you know, somewhat shenanigans that, um, you know, that, that, that take place in college and make the college experience wonderful, but also some really competitive baseball teams, some good players. And, um, you know, this is a, this is a program that, you know, I was in the second year of the program getting started and, you know, there's a lot of pride and, and energy and effort into, into building the program and competing and representing the school well. And we, I think we did all those things. Well, that, that's a good – I think people have forgotten there – literally there was a group of student athletes that helped build that field, uh, Greenwood Field. So that's that's a good story. You also mentioned you got a degree in business. And we know um, throughout the many, many years, and certainly with Mike Gordon, <clears throat> many stories about our former student athletes. We've always been scholar athletes. Um, our faculty members love our student athletes. Tell us a story or maybe about one of the faculty members that really um, made a difference in your life. Well, there was, um, first of all, I was grateful for the size of UNC Asheville and then the heart for the um, administration and the professors to um, work with a young man who was really quite candidly a little lost at times and trying to find his way. And, and, um, and, you know, they helped me stay on, on, on the, on the trail, so to speak, and worked with me and cared about me. And that's probably the thing that, that, uh, I appreciate the most is they really were genuinely cared about, you know, me being able to, to navigate through, um, academically, um, to, to where I could get that business degree. And, you know, it was really at a lot of different levels. Each, each professor I had really was understanding and, and, and sometimes sympathetic maybe, but, um, you know, about, about, you know, me being being um, able to to navigate through their class and and help me in areas because candidly you know it's a really as we all know it's a, it's an excellent academic school and and um, I won't I won't be afraid to admit that I need I needed some academic help I needed some some guidance and some support and and if I was in another place I'm I'm really confident I wouldn't have received it so eternally grateful for the entire um, UNC Asheville faculty and and. Uh, what they were able to provide for me. It was, it was very um, important to where I am today. Yeah, we love our faculty members. They are, they are, they're the best in the country, no doubt about it. So now I'm gonna shift a little bit. It's something a lot of people might not know. And I actually um, first heard about you through Mike Gore, obviously, and then another one of our um, dear friends from over in that Charlotte area. When you were over in Charlotte, you also did a lot with um, youth baseball. Um, a lot of teaching and, you know, a lot, like a lot of coaches do talk about, you know, that program, because we know a lot of young men that came through what you were doing in Charlotte ended up playing college athletics and, and opportunities and probably all the way to the major leagues. Tell, tell our friends a little bit what you did in Charlotte. Yeah, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, a lot of good players that came through the Charlotte area. And I looked up after you leave in Asheville and coaching at West Charlotte and then at UNC Charlotte. Um, and I always felt like that this, this growing, you know, now major city, but this growing vibrant city wasn't, didn't have real a lot of representation from its athletes playing collegiate baseball. And, and so, you know, again, I looked at my passion and, and look, my, my, journey went the way it was supposed to, but um, I just want to create more opportunities for, for sincere baseball players that were also good student athletes to, to you know, so we started a program called On Deck and started it in um, the concept of it in 99, um, launched it in 2000, 
I'm pleased to say that um, it's still in existence today. So it stood the test of time. And, and you know, the, the thing I appreciate about it, we I did it for, for almost four years and then turned it over to the, to the Hill family, baseball family in Charlotte. Um, three brothers, their dad, Gary, um, who's since passed away, unfortunately, but pitched in the big leagues with the, with the Braves. Um, anyway, you know, it's, it's really a combination of making sure that players that really are sincere about their career, but also sincere about their academics. Um, and it's a familiar type environment where we help the families understand and navigate, um, you know, for the benefit of, the, of Coach Friedholm and, and the people in the college athletic world or what, what really, you know, how you should think about doing and making sure you're academically prepared for it. Um, and the thing I was most pleased about is um, virtually every player that went through the program, and it's still the case, um, but through that four-year period, you know, found a place to play, but over 100 players um, took place and found a collegiate place to play. But most importantly, um, all but two stayed in the, in, the school, in the school they originally went to so that we, you know, we found good fits for them um, academically, hopefully financially, and then athletically. And, and, um, and I'm pretty certain all of them graduated. So, you know, it's a program of, of, um, of love and passion and, and dedication to help, help people get where they want to go with their, with their baseball dream. Mike, that, that's a great story in itself because, um, as you well know, and all of us in athletics, some, some sports is the avenue for people to get that education and those lifelong friendships and, um, as we say, champions in athletics and leaders in life. And, and for you to do that program in Charlotte. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Mike, I had um, a friend of mine on talking about the Butler way. Today, I want to talk about anybody that knows anything about St. Louis Cardinals. They have a unique culture and a, a program that they have built. And I know you uh, share a little bit about the St. Louis organization because it's it's all the way from the bottom to the top. And, and explain that culture and why that's so important and why they're so successful. Yeah, you know, we don't claim to have all the state secrets and do it anything better than anybody else. We just do what we've done for uh, you know, a long period of time. And, and um, you know, as, as the world evolves, we've evolved with it. So as part of the process is continuing to create that sweet spot between old school and, and um, a new way, new ways of thinking. So, you know, it becomes even more of a challenge, but we welcome the challenge. But, you know, ultimately it was created. And, and the, one of the first things I realized when I got the card organization was that regardless of department, and one of the first gentlemen I met was a guy named Freddie McAllister, in the scouting department and older gentleman. And he came up and introduced himself and welcomed me and ended up being a mentor of mine, um, which is how it really works there. There's a lot of intellectual um, property that continues to get shared and people feel like they're caretakers of the, of the organization. I think that's really to, to segue real quick, but you know, one of the things that when people care more about something other than themselves, you have something pretty special and irrespective of department, um, you, that's what I realized early on. And Freddie, you know, introduced himself and asked me how long I've been in the organization. I said, two days. He goes, okay, that's great. And I said, how about you? He goes, 59 years, um, you know. And then I go into, into the player development side. I mean, a gentleman named George Kissel, who was um, spoken about by Tony La Russa and, and, and Joe Torrey in their Hall of Fame induction speeches as being big parts of their development. And George was a part of our organization for 66 years and basically um, – created culturally and fundamentally how we do things on the on the field and what that dedication looks like and the um, making sure the little things and attention to detail and like I said the fundamentals are taken care of and and that's just been passed on and I'm you know as like a second generation of Mr. Kissel um, and and but I also looked up and even from a clubhouse perspective you know the guys that take care of the clubhouse and um, getting Buddy Bates and Jerry Rich I meet them and they ended up with over 50 years of experience in our organization and uh, getting Mike, Mike Batani um, ran the stadium and was part of running at multiple stadiums and, and retired after 53 years of experience. And, you know, regardless whether it's tickets or our stadium operations or front office or scouting or player development, um, you're just dealing with people that, that have been there a long time and, and know how, you know, how to navigate things when things don't go as well. And I, and I think that's an, there's an important resource and it all just kind of works together. And, you know, we just care about the organization. Like I said, more than we care about our own careers. And, and that's a, 
that's um, you know, it's a challenging thing to get in a culture. And it's not to say people don't have and want their own desires for their career. They they earn it and work and 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 deserve it. But um, you know, we we just want to be good caretakers and stewards of the card organization. I think that's a, a big part of of the su- sustained success um, in a in a highly competitive, thin margined um, world. Yeah, that you know that part about when you care about the organization, sometimes more than yourself, that that's sort of the secret sauce when it's not all about you, but it's about us and them. And, you know, that's a lesson for all of us to learn. So now let, let's, you know, obviously you, you work your way up to the major leagues, you're in the, you're in the dugout with everybody. And then all of a sudden they are introducing you as the interim manager. What, what, change from being just part of the staff and then you know obviously you are the manager now what's different about that when you're the person managing the st louis cardinals well you know like i said you always always felt like you want to bring value to the organization put your piece into what you're doing at the moment and and, um i've always done you know and accepted whatever they wanted me to do because i'm grateful to have been in the organization in the first place um you know, that was a really bittersweet time because it meant that the, the current manager had been relinquished of his duties. And um, I was the bench coach at the time, which, you know, as a bench coach, you're, you're obviously the second in charge, so to speak. But um, your job's to support, you know, in that situation, Mike Matheny, who gave me my opportunity to coach in the big leagues. And so, um, you know, I felt like I'd failed him and, and felt failed a little bit in my, you know, my responsibility to to make him look good. And uh create an opportunity for us to to succeed and you know the fact of the matter the organization made a switch and and um you know it suggested you know I suggested but put me in that role and and um so it was super really bittersweet and you realize really quickly how different a couple three feet is standing next to the guy making decisions than being the guy that has to make the decisions and and um you know it's a it's a job that I appreciate and it's a job that I've studied again not ever expecting to do it I just tried to be take a holistic approach to being the best baseball guy I could be and uh, create opportunities for myself to create that value I mentioned earlier. And, um, but you know, it's, uh, it's got a lot of different things that take place on a daily basis. Some, some are a lot of it are public. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's still um, interesting to know that you go out and the majority of your job is done in front of the world. And, um, and, and, you know, baseball, the wonderful thing, Coach Freedom can, can appreciate this as well is, you know, one of the wonderful things about baseball is everybody's got, uh, not everybody, most everybody's got some familiarity with it, playing baseball, softball, watching it. You know, I still believe it is America's pastime. And um, so because of that, there's there's an opinion associated with it, which is which is healthy, too. And, um, you know, it's it's a really a great part of it. But, uh, you know, we do it in a, at a um, national level that, that we do it at. It's um you know, you accept the responsibility of it and uh, just try to be prepared and make the best decision you can and and um, and just just try to create every game and every moment. Just try to stay present, and do the best you can to make a quality decision based on the information, you know, and, and then support it. Well, and I, I know you all are in, in the heart of your season right now for, for our fans, you know, like I say, we, we watch professional baseball and it's always fun. You're watching. Give us a behind the scenes of what's really happening on a game day for you. I mean, what's a typical game day like? Uh, It's changed a little bit with COVID. It's getting back to more normal, um, thankfully, for all of us just personally. Um, But from a game day perspective, you know, the first day of a series is typically the, well, not typically, is the the most – I don't know if hectic is the right word. There's there's a lot of organization taking place prior to that first game of a series because um, once you get past the first game of a series and you get into a series, now you're starting to prep for the next series while you're in that series. Um, but the first day of a series is, um, you know, meetings, pitchers get together and, and we discuss. Mike Maddox, our pitching coach, um, goes over the opposing team, how we're going to attack them. Um, we have a daily what we call ball talk with our position players, but um, and we have a daily staff meeting, but the first day of a, of a, um, of a series, you know, is a lot more of the, you know, finishing dotting our I's, crossing our T's, um, preparing for what takes place. But, you know, so that's, that's generally speaking what, what happens. And of course you go out and you have batting practice and, 
every day we come in from batting practice, me and Mike Maddox and Oliver Marmel, um, our bench coach, sit down and um, Brian Eversgert, our bullpen coach, comes in and lets, lets us know who's available in the bullpen, how guys are feeling. And then we um, we have the other teams line up and then we just we just role play game playing the game. Um, so when the game starts, um, we're prepared. We call it, you know, like the black and the white. You know, we got the black and the white we're playing for. And then the game starts, and a lot of great takes place. Um, so we try to, you know, have an idea of what happens, you know, once the game happens, and how we adjust, and have an idea of what we want to do, how we want to do it. Because, you know, one thing that happens during the course of a game, it um, there's a lot of decisions that have to happen very quickly, especially in a National League setting, and they seem to always, not always, but they can happen at similar times where you have to hit for a pitcher, who you're going to hit for, who you're going to bring in. Um, and those decisions, you know, affect the rest of the game. So you're making decisions in the moment that, that impact that moment, but also impact the rest of the game. So anyway, um, it's a blessing. It's, it's a, it's a lot of, uh, we have a wonderful staff that uh, we work very well together. We have a tremendous, um, dedicated, very professional team that, that is very collaborative and, and has a strong desire to win. And so, the, um, you know, we just, work together and do our best every day to, to lay it out there so we can shake hands at the end of the game. Well, we're going to let some questions be asked, but I got one more for you. You know, spring training is always very interesting, but I think last, I think it was last year's spring training, you had a little interesting activity in your spring training. <laughs> you, you want to tell our fans what happened in last year? Scott's going, he's like, what is she talking about? Why don't you yeah, tell we, what yeah. happened last year in spring training? So last March 6th, um, I, I married, I got married on an off day in spring training um, to my wife, Michelle. And, you know, what, like, we try to figure out the best scenario to do. We got engaged earlier in the, you know, in 2019 and um, didn't want to really plan a wedding or go through it during the course of a whole season. Um, not that it's a distraction, but, you know, there's a lot of other focus that takes place during the season. And, um, you know, we're both, you know, I'm a little older in life and, and she's younger, but, um, but still we've had our life experiences and, and, and gotten to a point where we, we realized it was a, it was a good situation for us. And she's got two beautiful daughters, Laura Grace and Madison and, and, um, just awesome stepdaughters. But, um, we just decided, Hey, let's do it, you know, during spring training, her, her twin identical twin sister lives in Palm beach. So, um, and it just made a lot of sense. And a lot of people that I was going to be having the wedding anyway, um, were going to be there. So she, uh, you know, put it together and, and had a nice event, uh, and a beautiful wedding and, and, um, a little atypical of a day off in spring training. Well, congratulations. I read that story. I just thought it was so cool. And, uh, also one of our bulldog friends, realized, you know, we're all focused on our competition, but we got real lives too. So it's really good. David Jandrew, I know we got some questions because we're going to let Mike go here in a few minutes. So fire him away. Let's, it's your turn. All right. So, Mike, do you want me to start with the Dodgers questions or finish with those? I can. Uh, However you want to do it, my man. It's just, you know, <laughs> bring it. Um, I, I, it is kind of funny. I, I want to know who was more surprised to have you at home for an extended period of time. You or Michelle, because I know you both planned on getting married March 6th. Well, you'll be gone. Who, uh, who was more surprised to have you at home and who uh, was ready for you to get back out of the, out of the house sooner? <laughs> That's a good question, David. So, yeah, I mean, we, we sit there, you know, we got married on day off. So no real honeymoon kind of, you know, tabled that for the off season. And then um, literally a week later, COVID really hit and the country got shut down. So then we turned into the longest honeymoon in possible history, um, you know, for about three months. And, um, you know, candidly, the good news is, is neither one of us were like, you know, we were excited to get the season started. So that part was great. But um, I don't think we we're ready to, you know, we weren't at wit's end. So it was uh, actually proof that we'd made a, a quality decision. Because, you know, the three months of that, you know, was really probably in dog years, probably like, you know, seven years. Um, but it was, uh, you know, she didn't, she, she didn't, she helped me pack. <laughs> that's, that's a good answer. Mike, one of the questions we have is how did your uh, coaching style change from the minor leagues up, up to the majors? Well, it's a really good question. As a, you know, um, so I got some advice. Um, when I was coming up and uh, Louis Aguayo 
played and, and coached in the big leagues and was a coach in our staff and the Cardinal organization. And he said, and it's not absolute, but it, it, it frames it. He said, you know, you, you, you can tell a minor leaguer, but you, you ask a big leaguer. Um, and I've always felt like I've been pretty collaborative with players, irrespective of, of levels. I think that's an important way of, to approach it. Um, you're working with them. It's their careers. You want them to get the most out of it, and again, regardless of level. But you get to the big leagues, and you're dealing with guys that are at the highest part of their profession. And if you think about that, um, you know, you, you would have a hard time going to the one percenters in any profession and, and telling them what to do um, because they've earned the right to they, – they've accrued the experience and understanding and deserve the – rightfully the, the opportunity to – to weigh in on what they're doing. Of course, you, you do have to manage and guide it. And, um, but, but ultimately you work, you work with them and, and um, get their thoughts and share their thoughts and trust their thoughts. Um, and, and that's one thing that's been important to me. We've got a really good group of, of players um, physically. We also have a lot of really, really um, smart players as well. And, and um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that I got all the answers. So I've been able to, to listen to them, work with them, trust them. And, and um, it's been a it's been a benefit for me. Piggybacking on that, uh, Mike, how is analytics and, and all the numbers, how has that played a role as you've adapted as a as a manager? Well, you've reached the you hit the word on the, you know, the adapt is the you know, you it, it, if you don't adapt in the, in any profession, you're gonna, you know, old school is gonna turn into old fool real quickly. And um, so you're gonna and adaption is important. It's, it's even more important now. Um, you know, the biggest thing is sifting out because don't misrepresent old school still works, you know, fundamental, you know, foundational um, pillars still still work in our, in, I think, in our society and in our in our game. Um, you know, the analytic part, there's there's so much of it. So you just want to create a sweet spot and a blend between the two and um you know, the one thing I encourage our staff to do in our baseball development department, I do myself, is is put all the information and bring it down into simple and actionable um, bits of information. And if it's not going to help help us win a game or help a player get better, then you know we candidly won't won't use it. It's information, um, but a lot of it's information that really helps us be more efficient in how we individually and collectively play in our days. And of course, it can help with strategy as well. So. Um, it's a it's a great tool. It's um, you know it's not anything that you know we have to be married to completely, but it is something that's very important and and um, become more prevalent in our game and our society. And and it's just a matter of how like anything else, how to use it properly. And that one came from uh, Sean Galley Gallagher, one of uh, oh yeah our our Good alum player. I've here, here's a very specific. You didn't think we'd go this in depth today, Mike. What did uh, what did Mike Maddox say to Alex Reyes last night that got uh, six straight sliders and two strikeouts? Um, you know, Mad Dog, we call him Mad Dog. Mike Maddox, our pitching coach. Um, Greg Maddox's brother. He's he's um, man, he's really good at what he does, and he's got a nice ability to go out and and just again, you talk about working with the guys. So he just went and encouraged Alex to, um, you know, just don't don't trust your stuff. It's plenty good. Um, really just maybe gave him a little bit of a blow to um, Alex is a guy that understands what he's doing, how he's doing it, but just gave some words of encouragement, a little bit of clarity and, um, and then let him do his thing. As someone who played coach collegiately and now obviously is, is having the success that you are in the major leagues. If you could sit down in front of uh, Scott's team, what advice would you have for them, whether it's athletically, academically, personally, as they're uh, going through their their time at UNC Asheville? Um, first one, just enjoy your experience every day. Um, you know, you get a wonderful opportunity to go play a wonderful game with with um, with people that you're competing with that you don't even realize are going to be lifelong friends. And um, just stay in the moment because it, it goes pretty quickly. And um, just enjoy and, and play the game passionately. The other one is play the game aggressively. Um, you know, it's 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 a game of failure. Um, sometimes we play not to you know not to make a mistake or or not. But you know what? You you work hard for a reason. You practice hard. You train hard. You you do all these things to to prepare physically, emotionally, mentally 
when the game starts, you know, go play, have fun, enjoy it, trust what you trust your ability, um, and then just be aggressive, get after it. You know, you're going to make a mistake, but um, you know, it, you'd much rather sleep at the end of the night knowing you went after it aggressively and trusted your ability, um, and you can live with that, and then you learn quicker from that as well. So, uh, just enjoy yourself, trust yourself, and um, enjoy the the passion that comes with with playing collegiate baseball at UNC Asheville. Oh, that's some great advice. And Mike, we, we want to be mindful of your time. So I, I want to say on behalf of Chancellor Cable and all of our Bulldogs, wherever they may be today, those that are still here on campus and all around the world, we are so proud of you. Um, you are certainly one of our most distinguished alumni and, and obviously very humble and um, all the kinds of things that we describe as a champion and a leader. So I want to thank you so much for your time today. And now I'm going to be able to get on the Scott here for a few minutes and say, why don't you apply some of that? No. <laughs> um, Scott's doing a great job, but you doing a great job. We want to thank you again for joining us and we'll, we'll be following. Certainly. I know I do. I follow St. Louis because of you. And um, so thank you again. And once again, you know, uh, we love you and we really appreciate you. So thanks for your time and uh, good luck with the, the series here. Thanks, Jan. Appreciate it. Very privileged to be able to spend some time with you. Always appreciate it and very grateful for my time at UNC Asheville. And Coach, wish you all the best. Finish strong and um, everybody have a blessed day. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Let's switch over to some Bulldog uh, baseball here. And um, Scott, I, in general, I kind of want to, you know, obviously I'm your boss. David's your supervisor. We've been following. Um, it's definitely a different year. And I'm saying that on the field. Like we've had we've had some success. And, you know, we're winning some um, two out of three on these series. And, you know, we got a home run hitter that's like none other what's different? You know, we ask this question a lot of times, tell us what's different with COVID. Forget COVID. What's the difference between what you've seen from last year to this year? Um, I think a little bit of it is because of COVID. Um, and, and we are the, the, the sport or the season that lost um, their, their season. So we, we were a bit more tied in with each other um, and what Mike was talking about when you have something that is more important than yourself uh, that's when something truly special can happen um, and I think when our season got shut down the guys realized what they lost it wasn't just their own career or their own season but they lost that friendship for that year and uh, I think they they realized that they have an opportunity to to help each other and play for each other and that's what they truly are doing this year they they bought into the team teammate self. Uh, that is kind of our saying. Um, and Mike said, he nailed it when you said, when he said, you, you put something bigger than yourself forward, uh, better things tend to happen. And I think that's exactly what happened this year. Um, you know, that, that Brandon Langford isn't just playing for Brandon Langford right now. Brandon Langford's playing for <clears throat> Chris Trost and Cole Harris and Ty Kaufman, who was a freshman. And it doesn't matter their age. He just, they are truly playing for each other this year. And it, and it shows. Since you mentioned our home run hitter there, I've got to ask this question, though. For, for, you know, obviously, I think we got some real baseball fans on, on this um, webinar and probably maybe some people not as familiar. How does one, you know, you would think, well, if he can do it, why can't I? What makes him such a, a great long ball hitter? I mean, it's, it's fascinating to watch when he comes up. I think he says the home run every time. Uh, so do I, to be honest, I, you know, you get, you get spoiled, you get disappointed when he doesn't hit one. Um, but he is, <clears throat> he's just very strong. And when he came here as a freshman, he was only 17 years old, which is uncommon. Um, you know, he's still, this is his fifth year, but he just turned 22. Um, so he was very young and, but he has always been strong and it doesn't necessarily translate into the weight room as far as strong, but it translates to a baseball player. Um, his legs are strong. He, his rotation is quick. Uh, his wrists and his forearms are very strong, which helps with him hitting. Um, and it also helps that he is a very mature and having this extra year, he has matured as a hitter. If you look at Brandon's numbers, as far as home runs, 
they've been basically 10 to 12 every year. Uh, this year is a little bit higher, but his batting average this year, he's gone up about 100 points this year. He's now hitting about 360, cut down on his strikeouts. He's got more walks now, uh, and he's become an all-around hitter. So I think that extra year of maturity uh, has really helped him into this year. Uh, and, and he is one of those guys that really worked hard during this COVID when he was at home. Uh, he did, he actually lost weight and got into better shape and it's helped him uh, and it's helped his game all around uh, as I think he's six of six or stolen bases. So he can do a little bit of everything for us. Well, for our friend, talk about the records though, that he has gotten this year, just in case people that aren't familiar with baseball and how, how this is so impressive. Yeah, he uh, became the all-time home run uh, hitter in UNC Asheville history. Um, that happened about two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And <clears throat> just recently, he became the fourth ever in the Big South uh, to hit 50 or more home runs. And with his home run on Sunday, he has moved into second place all-time um, for home runs. But with the NCA changing their bat rules and kind of uh, dumbing down the bats is, a, is the wrong phrase, but it, they've made it harder to hit home runs with the bats. He is actually the leader um, all time in big South history since they've made that adjustment to bats with 51 now. And I believe the record, David, you may have to help me. I believe the record for the big South is 53 total. So he's got, we've got six games where we're hoping he hits at least two. Uh, and maybe uh, can hit a third and, and help us get into this tournament here. So you mentioned bats, and I think you know. Obviously, we're trying to give our fans more here than they can just get from watching or reading. Talk about why we changed the bats, why the NCAA, because you, you said dummy down the bats. Because I think that's an important point. Um, to be quite honest with you, the bats were dangerous um, back in the day. Um, you know, when I played back in the late 90s, they were what we call a, a drop five. So a player could use a 33 inch bat, but the weight was only 28 ounces. Um, so that means you had more bat speed, which means the exit velocity coming off the bat was higher. So when a guy's throwing 90, 92, the ball is coming off the bats at 115 to 120 miles an hour. Well, as it was getting fairly dangerous for a third baseman in the, in the pitcher. Um, and there were some injuries happening and, and it was, the game itself was getting a little out of control. Um, it was, uh, Pete and Cavillia who, um, you know, is a bit older, but I'm sure people know that name. I, I believe he hit 40 something home runs in one year at Oklahoma state. Um, so it was, it was just getting a little out of control. So they were making, they were trying to make the game of baseball kind of mirror what the major league baseball with the wood bats were doing. Um, so we've made the adjustment with the bats in the last 10 years. And actually in the last uh, four or five years, we've made an adjustment with the baseballs as well. And we've gone to what they call the low seam or basically the same baseball um, that the major leagues use. So the pitchers, it gives the pitchers a little bit more of an advantage as well. So they can manipulate the ball a little bit more as well. So that helps. So in other words, I'm summarizing this, putting it in Janet Cohn Layman's language. Um, what he is achieving is a lot harder than it was even five years ago. Um, yeah, uh, what he is achieving is definitely a lot harder than what was 10 years ago. Years I think ago. that bat move was probably the last five to six yeah. years. But um, but yes, 100%. And that's what I want to make sure people understand is he is the leader of the Big South since they have made that change. And, yeah. and to get to these numbers that that people had reached 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago is very impressive for what he is doing as a hitter and as a player. Right. I'm going to um, follow off a question that David asked Mike. I think I want to talk a little bit about analytics, but I actually want to get a, a little more specific for those of you who have been watching our games on ESPN plus. If you now notice, it kind of reminds me of quarterbacks in football. Our pitcher's got something on his arm. We got uh, the catcher's got something on his belt buckle. I think the third baseman's got what is all that for those people that are kind of watching? Like, what are they looking at? Let's, let's give them some inside information. Okay, so um, Mike mentioned there's a fine line between old school and new school. 
And I truly consider myself old school, but trying to move into the newer school. So this is all basically stemmed from the Houston Astros and stealing signs. Um, back in 2017 or 2018, David probably knows those dates better because they beat his Dodgers. So um, in, in order nowadays in college baseball and in the Big South, but basically all across the board, we have to use a program called Synergy. It is a film um, breakdown where every league and every team has it. So we can go look at film for every pitcher, every hitter. But the camera is always in dead center field. And it can just sit there for a whole game and stare at the catcher at the signs. So a lot of teams and a lot of programs can steal the signs for the future games if they have a man on second base. So what we do and what a lot of programs are now doing is it is basically a pitch call uh, system that we relay in from the, from the dugout. Our position players like to use it, especially um, Langford at third base and Dominic Freeberger at first base because they want to know when we might be throwing an off-speed pitch that a guy might be a little bit early and pull towards their, towards them. Um, the pitchers only look at it when there is a guy on second base. So that way we don't have to relay the signs to the pitcher from the catcher while there is a man on second base. When there are men just on first and third, we just go through the catcher who then gives the signs to the pitcher. Um, so <clears throat> it is not something that I thoroughly enjoy because I think it slows the game down a little bit. And I think there is, for all these people on that think baseball is a slow game to start with, we are even sometimes slowing it down even more. I like to have a rhythm and a tempo in a game, but if it means to slow it down a little bit so that the hitter doesn't know exactly what's coming every pitch when there's a man on second, then I think it's something you have to do. So more and more are actually going to this now, like you said, offensively, the third base coach is giving out numbers and they all have them on their belt loops or in their back pocket. We haven't gone to that yet. Um, good to know. A little inside um, baseball talk there. Um, I want to. You mentioned some of our players' names. I, I want to go back to Friday um, because you had a group of seniors. Talk to us a little bit. We did a senior recognition with some of the parents here. Talk about our senior players that have been with you this whole time, and um, give us a little insight about those seniors that graduated. Um, we recognized them on Friday, and they graduated on Saturday, and they also played baseball over the weekend. Yeah, so um, we had seven guys graduate this year. Um, we had actually three our first time uh, in, under our program. We've had uh, three junior college guys graduate. Um, and those three I was very proud of because they were our first three junior college players and they all graduated in their two years. Um, so um, they are not going to take advantage of their fifth year. They're going to move on. They all have jobs. Um, one of them is already engaged, so they're ready to move on and move forward, which is understandable. Um, we have Ethan Tressler, who was graduated in his four years here, uh, a right-handed pitcher, uh, reliever for us that graduated um, with, I believe, a uh, economics degree and is actually just put down his payment and he is going to law school at the University of Kentucky uh, starting this fall. So obviously very proud of him. And then the three, their parents call them the COVID three. Uh, they are the three seniors um, that took advantage of their extra year of eligibility. We had six total, three decided to move on and three came back. Um, Chris Trost, um, Cole Harris and Brandon Langford. Um, Cole, Chris Trost is kind of our, he is our leader. Uh, he is kind of our spark plug. It may not show it by his numbers, but he is the one that gets everybody and keeps everybody together. Um, Cole Harris is the all-time saves leader. And he was that before he came back for his fifth year. Uh, and then Brandon Langford obviously has the record for home runs. And I believe David read it off, RBIs, hits, doubles, the whole nine yards. So, um, and the thing I am very proud of them, um, and I said this in the speech, um, they have handled themselves with such dignity and such class through a tough um, pandemic, um, but they have done a great job. They maintained a, uh, we had a 3.25 GPA last semester. Uh, we don't know our GPA yet this semester. Hopefully we're still right there. Um, but they have, uh, they have also grown into amazing men. Um, 
and I told this to their parents, they came in as, as great students and young men, but I think they have graduated and left here as even better men that, and as, as Mike said, they, they care about each other more than they care about themselves. So obviously they are, uh, they, we are very proud of them. Well, and we're very proud of you. Like Mike, you are very humble and, um, and you've done a great job putting together the team. Talk a little bit about your staff, though, because sometimes, you know, people don't know who's really out there helping. Um, and I look outside or I go outside and I'll see them out there working on the field and, and all the behind. So let, let's talk about your staff a little bit and what their roles are. What are they actually? You know? So uh, we'll start with the newest and we'll work our way back. So um, this December, we lost our volunteer coach, Brad Giroux, who got a full-time position at a Division II school in Nashville. Um, so we were able to hire a, a, a young guy named Matt Kelly from Minnesota. Uh, he was a, he played uh, Division Three at St. Thomas out in Minnesota, uh, was part of a World Series team, uh, and had been a head coach uh, for a high school team that had won a state championship, but wanted to get into the college ranks. And I got his name through uh, Rusty Strap, who was the head coach at Gardner Webb. And Rusty and I were great friends, but he had known Matt and gave him a, a, a glowing review. So we were fortunate enough to get a very good coach in the middle of a season to come out and be a volunteer coach for us. Um, Kyle Ward is in his third year here. Uh, he is our pitching coach. He played at Charleston Southern. He coached at Florence Darlington Tech, a uh, community college or JUCO in South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina. Uh, and then he was at uh, a D2 up in New York uh, for two years prior to coming here as the pitching coach. Uh, and he's been with us for three years. And then uh, Chris Bresnahan, uh, AKA Breezy. Uh, he has been here since I've been here. He came in, we came in together. Uh, he was at Fordham University in New York before uh, coming here and he played at Elon and Breezy Breezy basically does everything for the program. He, uh, he's our recruiting coordinator. He works with our hitters. He works with our infielders. He's the one that is the one that's always talking me off the ledge when I think we're, you know, when I, when I need it the most, um, you know, he's the one that, that keeps me sane. So, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do all this without those guys. And, and, uh, I am very grateful, um, to have them and, and especially Breezy and Kyle for their loyalty over the last three and four years. So, and Breezy for seven years. Well, and you gave kudos and they do everything, but I'm gonna add a little more kudos. I think you and Breezy worked at least 99% <laughs> basketball games for us during COVID because that, that was what we were all doing. It was about, you know, team teammates and y'all were being great helping the bigger team athletic department and, and your, teammates which are the other sports so I want to thank you for that probably the you know and Mike Schilt mentioned that he helped actually build the original Greenwood baseball field talk about what um, the new dugouts and the fence and the netting and the what and the bullpen what that has meant for our program and the recruiting well uh, for our guys it shows progress moving forward, not only, you know, what they're doing, but the support of the athletic department yourself um, and David and Betsy and all the fundraising that advancement has helped us with. So, um, you know, our, our current players are ecstatic coming to the field every day. And that does change when you're excited to come to the field and, and to play on a very nice field every day, there is a change of attitude with it. Um, unfortunately, Janet, and you know, this, we haven't had, been able to have anyone on campus. Um, so, we, uh, we have put together a very nice virtual tour of the campus of our field. Um, and, and we're about to have our, you know, our end of the year meetings. And, and I think that is one of the great things that the, the student athletes in North Carolina now look at UNC Asheville as a true option for them to go to school, uh, not only academically, but athletically. And uh, it is now a choice for these baseball players, whether it's junior college players, high school players, transfers, the whole nine yards. So, um, you know, we have put ourselves in a great place uh, or at the start of a great place. Uh, and hopefully 
uh, we can continue to keep building on it with with smaller projects that can just keep enhancing the field and the in the and the uh, excitement around the program. But it absolutely has changed um, the way people in North Carolina look at UNC Asheville and our baseball program program because we are uh, we are now competing with other universities facilities wise uh, that we have not been able to in the past. I love the fact, too, um, we're certainly grateful for all of our donors and um, friends that helped us get the project going, but it's not finished. We still have, when, when you hear the David Jandrew um, announcing and doing some of the things, he's sitting under a tent, and not in a real press box. So we still got to get the more seating when our fans do come back next year and get our press box built and hopefully um, we've got to do something with our batting cages and perhaps an indoor batting cage, uh, maybe even shared facility with women's golf. So we got a little more work to do, but that's important to recruiting if we're going to continue to build this baseball program. David, I know we have a couple questions for Scott, so be, be careful, Scott. I, I've been very nice. David may come out of the left field or something here. Yeah, I was going to ask Mike the three worst umpires in baseball, but he jumped off. I don't know what uh, what happened. There. Um, so um, one of the folks on the call, Scott, wants to know, and, and I know what this answer is going to be, so they're, uh, they might be disappointed with this. When you're not at our ball field, what do you like to do outside, and, and, and how do you like to enjoy your free time? And I know that it actually involves more ball fields. Yeah, any time off uh, actually revolves around a nine-year-old and a 12-year-old uh, baseball team where I try to help coach, throw batting practice, or sit out in left field and just watch two little boys play and sit and talk to Angie. And those are our times uh, to kind of catch up as a family. But that's when we're not doing that, Janet, you won't like to hear this maybe as my admin, but we just like to, you know, we, we go to breweries as a family. We, we went to Mills River the other day to throw a football around outside with Angie's family who was in town, and we just wanted to be at a place outdoors and just hang out. So it's always revolving around sports, to be honest with you, whether it's basketball, baseball. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always sports or family is, is the two answers, or working a soccer game or a basketball game for UNC Asheville. Those are, those are my answers right there. But uh, I don't fish. I don't hunt. I've never shot a gun in my life. Um, I, you know, I, for people that don't know, I grew up in Boston. So if you shoot something in Boston, it shoots back. So that's why I've never shot a gun. Um, so we just, we just never grew up doing any of those things. So it was always revolving around a sport. And I was the youngest of five, um, four boys and one girl. Um, and um, you know, everything we did was competitive with each other. And then it just translated to, you know, the different age groups. Well, you mentioned not, never shooting a gun. So here's a question about your time at Navy. Uh, how did your time there help shape your, uh, your coaching style? Ooh, I think my time at every stop has helped shape my coaching style. Um, you know, I played for and then coached for the same guy for nine years. Um, I played for Paul Costacopoulos at Providence. And then I worked for him at the University of Maine at the Naval Academy for nine years. Um, but I also worked for a guy at Bryant named John Shogren, who's now the head coach at Rollins. Uh, I worked for Mike Gambino, who's the head coach at Boston College. And they all brought different things that I've tried to mold. Um, you know, so Paul Costacopoulos was definitely the practice plan. You know, it practice is more important than games for him. Because if you get practice right, then the game just takes care of itself. Um, you know, John Shogren was the way that you treat your coworkers. Um, in, in like Mike had said, kind of about the Cardinal way, I walked in on day one at Bryant's, and he had been the head coach there for 12 years, and he, could, he thought we were equals, which I did not, but he treated me like an equal. Uh, and then Mike Gambino had taught me how to treat your players. Um, and, and I've always and, – and I, I actually – I'm going to take a little steal from Mike and that we tell, and Mike Gambino taught me this too. You tell your freshmen what to do. You ask your seniors what they want to do. As far as what do you think? You let them have a little voice in the program. Um, and then that, and we've actually started doing that a little bit younger with the juniors as well, because we want them invested in everything we're doing, whether it be, 
practice planning, where we want to stay, where we want to eat, those types of things. Um, and like I said, you still have structure that they need to follow, but uh, you want them to get invested in more than just the playing side. Uh, you want them invested in the whole program. So um, I would say a little bit of everything from every program. The Naval Academy for five years was really cool. I will say that. I've met some of the... I, I am fortunate enough to say that I've coached five Navy SEALs, uh, which not many people can say. And when they're 18 to 22 year olds, you, you know, there's just something a little bit different in them. Their drive is a little bit different, but I've also coached two major leaguers that came through the Naval Academy. And, you know, there was a little bit different in them athletically and their drive to be athletes. So <clears throat> the drive of those kids at the Naval Academy were just a little bit different and it wasn't necessarily towards baseball. It was whatever their passion was going to be for the next five to 10 years after graduation. And then the last one, um, preview your last two series for, for the regular season. We've got some, uh, some pretty good opponents coming up. Yeah, we got the first and second place team. Uh, we open up uh, at Gardner Webb this Friday and Saturday, uh, and then we go our home against USC Upstate. So uh, both series are going to be a challenge, but you know we've played Upstate at home and at and away, and they have been both great games, uh, both tie ball games into the seventh and eighth innings. Um, so our guys, you know, we are we are. I don't want to say we are confident we can beat them, but we know we can be there. We know we can compete with them. Uh, obviously the arms are going to be a little bit different on the weekend, but they're also going to see different arms from us. They're going to see Jacob Edwards and Cole Harris and, and Justin Honeycutt. So uh, Gardner Webb is going to be different because we've seen them twice and it's been a tale of two cities uh, for us. They, they handed it to us once and then we were leading into the ninth inning of the last one and uh, made a mistake in the ninth. Um, where they were able to score two runs to beat us. So, you know, I, I think if we just worry about ourselves and worry about the way we play and not get caught up in what Gardner Webb in USC Upstate does as a team or as a dugout, uh, and we just worry about staying on our own team, then we will be fine. If we try playing their game or what they do, it's not going to work well because we don't do that well. Uh, we worry if we worry about UNC Asheville, we're going to be just fine. So that's and that's what the message was last night. Don't get involved. Don't get caught up in everything else. Just worry about baseball. And that's what last night was. And and that is going to be the message for the next two weekends. Wow. That, I love the, the way you just ended. That's a great way for us to, to um, end today about, you know, we, we've got to worry about UNC Asheville. UNC Asheville athletics and, and our sports and sometimes we get distracted by all the other things that are going on out there in, um, in college athletics but let's just focus on what we need to do um, we certainly want to focus on in on all in and I know the baseball coaches and the baseball players and their managers and the trainers and their parents are, are all in for UNC Asheville and so I want to thank you for your leadership, Scott. David, I want to thank you for um, being the co-host again and Donna behind the scenes. And obviously, we want to thank Mike Schilt. Um, what a great interview and um, such a proud alum, too. And the one thing I've learned from Mike Schilt through the years, too, is um, he still lives that team, teammates, because he cares deeply about all the guys, that, whether it's Mark or John or any of the guys that not only played with him, but that come after him. And um, so Mike is a great example of a student athlete that we just cherish and love. I want to thank Mako Medical again. And, you know, we're going to continue to do these. We probably won't do as many during the summer, but we've got other guests to invite and to keep our friends um, engaged with us. But we are slowly getting back in person and having a few more. we got some parents out there watching baseball and, um, as we work our way back to the fall and this summer with camps, you're going to see more and more Bulldogs and Bulldog uh, friends and family members with us. So I want to thank everybody again. And thank you, Mako Medical, for sponsoring this. And as always, let's go Bulldogs. Good luck this weekend, Scott. Thank you. Thanks for having me.